fault. Here we are. I'm back. This should be working for almost everybody. I'm close to getting started, folks. Thanks for joining me on time. Just making sure that my, my lecture is in the right order because that would be nice. <laughs> that would be very nice, wouldn't it? Um, I looked at the lecture half an hour ago and realized, oh my gosh, I don't want things to be the way they are. <laughs> Um, and so I'm just going through to redo the order a little bit because I would like to land a kind of a nice demo today. protection unit is documented. Whoops. Contents MPU. Memory protection unit. As we go, I suppose. Uh -huh. One last thing I'm missing is my first slide. And just make sure I've got a, uh, a nice main function to jump into. Some main functions. I've got a micro bit plugged in. That means I am, I am shortly going to be ready to go. Uh, what am I missing? Probably my little tablet, and I'm missing my laptop. <laughs> Need that so I can answer your questions. Put my laptop somewhere useful. It is good to be able to answer questions during the lecture. started and good 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 g'day folks thanks for joining me here on Monday the 9th of May 2022 Ready for week 10, lecture one in comp 2300 slash 6300. Another glorious cold winter's day in Canberra, or at least we're getting towards winter now. Um, today's topic is operating systems. Operating systems. We've started to talk a little bit about, about this. Or various times people ask me questions about something and I'm like, oh, just have to wait until we get to the operating systems week and then we can talk about it. So we're here to talk about it now. I'm just getting my, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong screen. I'm getting my, um, my comments out. Should be fun. Uh, 
Um, how many people, I wonder, are, are watching? Shall I look in, in Chrome? Whoops. I want to see... 21? That's good. So I've got my typical classic audience. 21, um, 21 viewers on, on YouTube and 8 viewers on Twitch. Which is wonderful to have so many folks joining me live. I wonder if there's anybody watching just on Microsoft screen uh, streams. Shout out in the chat if you're watching on Microsoft streams. Before we get into the, the, the main event today, which is operating systems, we'll do a little bit of admin time. Um, we're now, I guess, in some sense, in the home stretch. You've got an assignment. You've got the second assignment um, coming in pretty soon. You should be starting to work on that. You've done most of the labs, most of the things you've had to learn about assembly programming you've now learned in your labs and now it's all about supporting that knowledge with new experiences, new faces of the same idea to, to really make sure that you understand these concepts really expertly, which is what I expect all Comp2300 students to achieve. This week you've got a really fun lab coming up. Um, last week in lectures we were playing around with making connections with a between a micro bit and one of my little uh, synthesizer. This little um, bad guy there. We In your labs you're going to make connections between a micro bit and a micro bit. And to do so you're going to need some little wires. So I've got a post here about little wires and their alternatives. So we can just have a look at that, that detail. When I say little wires I mean these little things, these little clippity clips that clip to your micro bit and you can connect some of the the little rings with those little crocodile clips. We've got several hundred of those little wires in the labs right now ready for you to play with um, this week, which is cool. But if you're not in Canberra and you're not able to come to your lab, does that mean you don't get to do it? No, of course not. You can do this, we've designed the lab actually so that you can do it completely um, by yourself, have all of the fun of connecting micro bits to another micro bit, except you're going to connect your micro bit also to your micro bit. And if you don't have little clip wires, there are alternatives. And I've got some ideas here. You could get a regular wire and just strip some of the insulator off and wrap it around the rings. That would be tricky, but doable. You could get a paper clip, kind of bend it so that it's pushing against the little rings. Again, doable. You could get a different kind of wire, like a, the kind that you use to connect a PC audio output to some speakers, PC 3.5 millimeter to 3.5 millimeter PC audio cable. Um, I've got an example of that working here. You can kind of just dangle your micro bit through those holes. That would work too. Uh, you can get some aluminium foil that you might have in your kitchen and roll it into a wire and then carefully thread it through ring zero and ring two. That would work. Uh, one of our tutors said you can even use two fingers because apparently it conducts enough to, to do the lab if you've got two fingers connecting the rings. That would be a bit annoying and possibly not what you want to do, but uh, it will certainly work, potentially, in a pinch. Um, I got some of these ideas, by the way, from the Microbit website where they've got a nice example of how to connect a, a speaker or a pair of headphones to a Microbit using, of course, clip wires would be preferable, but you could also use a paper clip like that or aluminium foil and someone stuck it down. It looks like they're in a classroom and they're just desperately trying to, to make something work, which they've managed to do, which is cool. Cool and good for them. Um, yeah, so there's lots of things you can do in that case, even if you don't have the exact materials which, which we provide in class. Um, you've got many options. Uh, one of our students uh, spoke to me on, on Piazza who actually is in Shanghai in lockdown. So obviously they can't access an electronics store or probably hard to get mail, almost impossible at the moment. Um, so they would have a hard time, but I say to them, go to, the, go to your kitchen and see what you can do. Quiz two is open. If you recall, we have a system of quizzes. <laughs> Quiz two, um, it's another one mark quiz. You get as many attempts as you want. Actually, I should check that everything's working out because I would like you to have as many attempts as you want. You get as long as you need, as long as you do it this week. You can see the precise dates that the quiz is open on Wattle, but I can see some people have tried it already. 
please make time to have a really good go at the quiz this week. It's part of your preparation uh, for the rest of the semester. And if you try the quiz now, you'll have done some of your study for your final exam and be in a good place to, to finish the course. Mid-semester feedback. Your marks are on streams right now. You should be able to see them. I hope, I hope that your mark is not a complete surprise. I hope that your mark is not depressing. I know that the marks, the level of the marks is a little bit down from the first assignment. Um, of course, I'd like everyone to get as many marks as possible in the assessments, but I can only give you marks for things that you say which are right. I will have more to say about the marks this evening. I've got a few students who have deferred their exams and I've just got, they've got until the end of today um, to get that exam done. And then after that, I will let you get back into the exam you can examine every question, try to find holes in it if you want, um, and argue with me if you want to on Piazza. I'm totally open to, to hearing any, any interpretations of the questions. Um, we've got stats available on the page right now. I'll show you them in a minute. Uh, and I'll just mention, I guess, that I've got quite extensive stats. The statistics for each question in the exam. You had eight questions, if you recall. And question seven and question eight were essay questions. The other questions were, um, were multiple choice questions. Um, these two questions are, um, we marked by hand. So those ones, those are the, the numbers I'm looking for, getting to around 60% for the, the mean for the question. So they're bang on, question seven and question eight. The other questions, you can see the, the mean results are potentially a little bit low. That's about 50%, these are out of five, 50% in Q1, a bit more than that in Q3, um, a bit less in Q6, and a bit more in Q, Q5 and Q2. Overall, the multiple choice questions were a bit hard. I'll talk about this more in my feedback post tonight on Piazza, but the, the multiple choice question was where it was tough, and that was where I um, think that you folks can do some improvement, hopefully over the next few weeks, going towards the final exam. So I'm, I'm not going to be answering questions until this evening on the exam, but then i um, totally happy to have those discussions once you've read the feedback of, on the whole exam and, and seen um, our perspective on those questions. So uh, I will say we have a, a fairly a normal distribution, normal-ish, and I mean that in the formal sense of um, the style of a distribution with a, a mean kind of around 60 um, in the middle. I think the mean was 58 over the whole exam, uh, 59%. So a little bit lower than the first assignment, um, but there's certainly room to step up everyone's game over the next few weeks. Where was I? Close that now. Assignment two, assignment two. Folks, you did your, your pre-submissions last week. And I was discussing with the tutors, of course, we, we heard lots of great ideas for what kind of a digital pet you might like to do. Lots of great ideas about different features you'd like to have in your digital pet. I guess what we were hoping for and didn't quite see over the whole class were a lot of precise ideas about how you were going to actually implement this, which is one of the things we wanted you to think about in the pre-submission. So our worry is that you've got great ideas for a digital pet, you have no idea how to actually do that, and then it's gonna be like six hours before the assignment's due and you're gonna panic and freak out. And I don't want that. So what I would like everyone to do, if they're listening, and I hope they are, is to go work on the assignment enough so that you have, can ask a question about your implementation. And I've seen some questions coming in about interrupts and buttons and, and things, which are great related to the labs. I'd like to see more questions coming in related to the assignment coming up. Uh, labs 7, 8, 9 are now done, or they will be done at the end of today, which is when the lab pack is due. Um, but I'd, I'd like people to struggle with the assignment and find out what they don't know, and then come into Piazza and ask about it, so that I can help you, because I want to. <laughs> Keep in mind that we have never asked students to make a digital pet with a micro bit before, because we are using the micro bit for the first time in this course. Um, I guess one aspect of this is that 
sometimes I forget that not all students have done my other course, which is Comp 1720, a first year course in, I guess, interaction and interactive computing, um, where I teach all of the students how to make an interactive program. And if you take the frame, the thought frame of that course and apply it into Comp 2300, you may, maybe would have a more clear idea about what to do, what, where to get started with structuring your interactive program for a digital pet. But, um, you know, that's just by the by. So, huh, yes, I'll provide you, we'll talk about this maybe a bit more later this lecture and maybe on Thursday, but I'll just leave that there. Final admin thing, I'm working this week through some old issues on Piazza. Thank you for your patience. If you've been waiting for a response for a long time, I know there's a few questions that keep getting bumped. Um, I can always filter by, by un, um, uncompleted responses. And this week, now that we're done with the mid-semester, I'll be going through and addressing all of those issues. Thanks for your patience on that one. So, on with the show. Here is the lecture for today. Week 10, Operating Systems. Here's my, my outline. You can look at that later when you want to. What is an operating system? What is an operating system? This seems like a stupid question, Charles. Of course we know what an operating system is. But do you know what an operating system is? These things all like look like stuff. Do you recognize any of these ones? Maybe you recognize this one from your, uh, your computer. And maybe you recognize this cheeky little person. These are all different kinds of operating systems. How many of them have you come across? You might recognize this one, Android. That one is just the generic sign for Apple, but I guess you could, it could represent Mac OS. Or Windows Mobile. Is that an operating system? Is that the logo for it? Does anyone know what, what that is? Anyone remember this one? Someone talk to me in the chat. Tell me which ones you remember or you know about. MS-DOS, that's right, that was the, the original Microsoft operating system called DOS, DOS, Disk Operating System. And then it, they created their other operating system called Windows. <laughs> Julian knows about Windows. Oh, I don't, I'm missing one, which is everyone's favorite one, Arch Linux. This is like, it's a, it's a meme on Reddit that whenever some kind of tech bro has a computer, they use Arch Linux. Sorry if you use Arch Linux and you don't consider yourself to be a tech bro. Um, it's, a, it's a perfectly cromulent operating system, uh, but it just seems to attract some, uh, some bros. Maybe we'll look at the, the big list of operating systems later. Ooh, someone else jumping in. Second from the right, ooh, Halal OS. Second from the right, middle row. <laughs> Halal OS, that's, a, that's a, a good one. I think that one's Mandrake Linux. Um, I believe so. Many of these um, symbols don't mean much anymore. Surely you know about this one. Tech pros use Kali Linux these days. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, shows how I'm not up to date on um, on the memes on Reddit, the Linux memes. What is an operating system? Someone, oh, someone says they can see a BOS. <laughs> <laughs> some some folks saying they, they use Arch Linux. Sorry, I wasn't accusing anyone of being a tech bro. <laughs> but it's certainly, I use Arch, by the way, is, is something a, a tech bro might say. Yeah, a few people saying they use Ubuntu. Now, folks, tell me what, what an operating system is. You Surely you have an intuitive idea, because right? I'd really like you to know. Well, tell me, what is an operating system? You can give me the lecture. Someone write in the chat, get your keyboard, and tell me, what you what an operating system is because you know what it is. I'll just I'll wait and sip my water. Well, oh, someone's already already skipped through the lecture slides already. A comfortable home for your program. What does that mean? 
Hmm. Oh, something that allows you to change the memory of the computer. Oh yeah, some we're getting some great examples here. So yeah, we got some something comfortable home. That's a good one. My island home. It's a Christine Randu song. Um, comfortable home. What makes it comfortable? And then someone's got another answer for that. And someone else has said the middle person. <laughs> between hardware and apps. Yeah, someone's got a great, there's a great um, version of this. Someone's saying handles low level parts, handles low level things. You know, I guess the sometimes I ask this question of a class and I hear a few through a few answers which are, I I guess are not quite as right. Um, people would say oh, it provides a GUI, right? A GUI. I was like, is that right? Not sure. Does it need to provides, they might say it provides like a, a way of choosing what program to run, chooser, or a finder, or a start menu. And then people go right on the wrong track and say like, oh, it provides a web browser. Well, that's a more of an application, isn't it? Or provides Minesweeper, provides apps, no. And these are, I guess, these answers make sense, and I can understand why people would say that. But really, that's sometimes I ask this question and people ask themselves a question, which is, what is a user interface? What is a, like, a general computer UI? And a general computing user interface is really not the same as an operating system. Because the, the user interface of a general computing system, like your laptop or your desktop computer, is really a way to manage your computer and for a user to manage their computer and for a user to open applications that they want to. And in a sense, that, that task or that role is the same role as MS-DOS has and is even the same role as some of the very earliest uh, software that ran on the very earliest portable um, personal computers. I'll give you a demo of that, not today, but another time this week. And really an operating system itself is a different job because a general computing UI doesn't have to work with your application in some sense. There, is a way, there are ways to make a general computing user interface that it runs itself and then you say, I would like to run an application and then that user interface is gone. Like it's, it's literally not running in memory anymore. So the operating system has to do, lives in memory all the time and it's always doing some of these roles of making, uh, ex existing in the middle between your hardware and your applications, handling your low level things. <laughs> uh, I see there's, a, there's some great, great thoughts here. Does the OS handle work with peripherals or do drivers? There's thinking time. Um, and then someone says, I guess it indirectly does because it interacts with the drivers. And I would say that the drivers really are acting as a, a extension of the operating system. They're like um, peripheral manufacturer provided extensions for your OS. So the, the OS provides an API for drivers to plug into and the, the driver writer has to work with that API. And then the, the, OS can then ask the driver to do something with the hardware. If we think about um, the Linux operating system, drivers, in a sense, aren't, aren't, don't exist in that same kind of inverted commas way as they do in Linux, because a driver is 
either part of the Linux kernel or which is the core part of the operating system or they are a module which plugs into the kernel either way ending up being part of the kernel okay enough enough chatter about what is an operating system let's look at what an operating system is in some sense you can call a, an OS a virtual machine and I'm using that term in inverted commas because I don't mean virtualization as in um, you know, running, running Windows on Linux or running Linux on Windows or running, you know, a Nintendo, a uh, Nintendo console on Windows. Drivers are a file? Drivers are a file, yes. That was a bad Linux joke. I'm talking about uh, an operating system creating a kind of fake computer from the perspective of an application. So when an application runs, it sees that it has some memory and it has a stack and it has some functions that it can call. And then another application runs and it also has some memory. And, and from their own perspective, from each application's perspective, they can only see their own stuff app one, app two. And the operating system is actually providing these things from the, the computer's own memory. So we, we learned about what an, a program needs to exist last, last week, really, not last year, two weeks ago, when we were talking about contexts, a context of execution. So really you can define a context, context of execution as like the set of current registers the current flags which are stored in a register and the stack space and current memory space. So the OS is really just providing these things and switching them in and out, doing those context switching tasks. So this is our main memory here and in a modern OS each application is given some virtual memory from the main memory. So they have their own addressing space within main memory, not the regular addressing space. And rather than your individual applications working with hardware by writing to memory map registers, because they can't see those memory mapped registers in general, they can only see their fake memory mapped, uh, their fake virtual memory spaces, the regular application will use some kind of special functions to, to modify hardware. Hardware, some kind of function provided by the OS. Finally, um, or next thing, the OS would manage multiple applications that might want to run on the CPU at the same time. So some kind of process management to allow multiple programs to work side by side on a computer. Um, we take this completely for granted these days because all of your computing systems that run an operating system provide process management. But it was not always thus. There were computing systems from when I was a kid that were really just single taskers. Like you'd run, run one process on DOS and then when you exit that, that program, uh, you are back in the DOS prompt, the DOS UI. You can't have two programs at once. So even on, on Linux with a, um, with a command line, you can still run lots of programs at once in the background. Then finally, We'll talk about process management later in this lecture, or probably on Thursday, actually. Finally, the OS provides some ways for different processes to talk to each other, into process communication, for whatever reasons they might have, but often, you know, you would have collections of processes, collections of programs that work together to make things work in an OS. It's a resource manager. So when you've got these multiple apps, I should have kept my, my drawing, app one, app two. These different applications are going to want to access the same things. So they both want to access memory, for instance. I would like to use all of this memory and I would like to use all of this memory. And the operating system is in charge of figuring out how to um, go between those things. It, you might also have other 
shared resources that your operating system wants to talk to. For instance, if you've got a um, single processor on your computer, both apps are going to want to use that processor as much as they can, but it's the operating system's role to make sure that they uh, don't run for too long or they give each other a chance to, to work so that they're sharing the, that resource effectively. Other stuff that are shared resources would be like your regular um, your regular storage, like your your flash storage or your um, SSD on your big computer or your SD cards or anything on a other kind of device that has different kinds of storage um, technologies. Communications, using a network connection, using something like a serial connection. We gave the, the demo last week of talking to a MIDI controller, a MIDI synthesizer over a serial connection, but if you had two bits of software, they'd have to share that GPIO, for instance, and there'd be, have to be some way to do that. And then organizing access to all of the regular devices that your computer has. Even your big computer has stuff like timers, of course, likely to have a, some kind of graphics um, processing system and other peripherals that I don't even know about. And all the time when you've got multiple apps running, they might want access to these resources at the same time. So the operating system is going to have to figure out some way to coordinate that. So those, those are the two real things, right? This is the virtual machine, the safe, comfortable environment for programs to run in and think that they're the only program running at, at one time and managing resources between different programs that want to access shared devices. A brief history of operating systems. A, it's a very brief history, just a few slides. But this is what computers used to look like um, in the 50s. Some big old IBM 704 mainframe um, in 1957 at NASA, not NACA. I don't know why I wrote NACA there. I should change that, fix that later. The you can see there's some uh, some switches here that are probably each switch representing one bit in a register. So you could manually enter um, manually enter some data into a register, and this technician here is operating a system for reading punch cards. So you're going to put a stack of punch cards into that uh, machine and the machine's going to t -t 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 process each single one. There's a stack of punch cards on the desk. And this is how you got a normal program into this computer. You wouldn't be putting it on tape. You would have punched, written each line of code out on some kind of um, special notepad worked out a way to encode it on the punch card and use a special typewriter that would punch lines in that card where each um, each card is like one line of code or something. I don't really know how that stuff works. It's way before my time. Although when I was a kid, punch cards were still around as like part of the ephemera of, of office work or computer work from the, the 70s. And there's probably some list of tasks or all the things that have to be run today and working out whose process is going to be run on the computer first. So you might have on this computer a, a program which is like our default program. And the default program is going to work out what the next program to be run is going to be. So you might have, have all of your programs um, input by this technician. They're waiting in the system. And you've got a batch processing program that's ready to run whichever programs go it is and work out if that program fails or is doing the wrong thing, it boots it out and, you know, writes an angry note to the person who, who wrote it or something or, or prints out the error so that the programmer can fix it and bring back a new stack of cards the next day. So the system monitor really, it's not running multiple tasks at once. It's running one task at a time and just providing these extra little features to, to make sure that this very slow process, very slow feedback loop of testing software and getting it to work um, can be done. Multi-programming system. So this, there was an evolution from um, mainframes that could run one program at a time to the idea that while the CPU is waiting, potentially there's some shared resource that takes time, like a printer or reading data from memory. Maybe you can make um, 
make better uh, use of your CPU by switching to another program for a second and doing something in that one. Uh, someone says, so if you made a typo in your program, you'd have to wait until the next day to fix it? Yes, you literally would. You would get your chance to run your program. Um, talk to anyone, any programmer, I guess, there's have to be people who are over the age of 50, um, and they may remember back in the days when they were running programs from punch cards on um, big, some mainframe somewhere. Um, if they were at university learning how to program in the 70s, you probably wouldn't have interactive access to a computer. You would be doing it on punch cards. Probably more like 60 now, I think. <laughs> These people would have to be. Certainly that's what my, my dad did when he was uh, um, working with original computer systems. Yep, um, someone's saying their mum used to work with them. They provided nothing but pain and suffering. Yeah, they were absolutely terrible. You would literally have to wait till the next day. Every You'd find out your program was broken when you got your results back in the morning after running it overnight. Maybe there were some privileged people who could get their, get their stuff worked at the front of the queue, um, but usually everyone I, I seem to talk about <laughs> would be like a, have been a student or a low-end graduate student or a low-end worker or something doing this stuff. Yeah, C is, C is a later invention. This is pre-C. But not out of the question. Most of these people would have been writing code in Algol or Fortran. And Fortran's totally still in use. Um, where was I? Multiprogramming, yes. Now we're doing not just doing one program at a time, but intersecting programs. So you might have program one running and then it has to wait for a while for a printer to print something out or to read data from a tape. And then it might run a bit, again a bit. And we want the operating system to say, okay, I'll run program two for a while. And then that one can wait. So multi-programming is running two programs at once on a computer, one at a time. And that, stuff started to become more more useful in the 60s. So this is an example of a 60s mainframe at the University of Manchester called Atlas. That was just a, a bespoke computer. 1970s, multitasking systems. <clears throat> so this is an evolution of the multiprocessing idea um, that makes it, provides essentially multiple interfaces. So more than one user can have a program running and they both think they have full control over the, the hardware. So we're not just waiting for a shared resource and making best use of the time that way. There might be some regular switches between uh, multiple, um, multiple programs. This is a really popular pro um, computer called the, the PDP-11 from the 70s. Um, it's by a company up here called DEC, um, which is still around. You can see the digital Digital, that's their, their logo, Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, and they made these very famous computers, which were, they weren't mainframes exactly, they were much smaller. They were only as big as like a, a huge refrigerator <laughs> in some sense. That's about, that's probably um, as wide as a washing machine or a refrigerator, except it would go up to the ceiling in a regular room. Um, so that's a very large piece of equipment. It's a huge rack of, of modules. But these were popular, um, not just with businesses, but particularly in the academic world for, because a research group could afford to have their own computer. When you were back in th these days on a, f on a mainframe system, your whole school of computing might have to have a computer or the, the university would have a computer. And in this one, a research group could have their own computer just for a few people and share it and have some multi -pro, uh, multitasking system with individual terminals so they could all have interactive access and think they were running the computer themselves. And again, you've still got this old school inputting one register of data at a time system as a sort of worst case scenario. Uh, workstations, so this is the first this kind of computer, which is a research computer called a Xerox Alto. I don't know if it was ever really a product. They probably sold a few, but as you can see, it's still like the size of a washing machine. And this is just the, this is the stuff that goes on your desk, screen and keyboard and mouse. 
these are these are incredibly influential computers and they really determined what computers that we use today would look like having a, a mouse and a keyboard and a screen and a separate box but the box here is massive these were invented in the 70s um, they basically ran the same kind of operating system a multitasking system <clears throat> I'll get to that in a second Adnan um, but it was taking advantage of advanced miniaturization to create a computer within a washing machine sized unit <laughs> which would still be stupidly expensive these were not computers that normal people would buy they would again be bought by businesses or universities um, but getting to be like a one person per computer modality where if you're doing multitasking it's because you wanted to have two programs running at the same time in some kind of graphical interface or way you can switch between them um, someone's asking why were computers so big um, it would be a few reasons everything was huge transistors were huge and I'm, I mean you can do some research about what's inside a PDP-11 but no, oh, let's do it right now PDP, was it a PDP-10? I want a PDP-11 there's a that's a tape machine for data that's probably a blank panel with nothing behind it that's the actual CPU there might be something behind that I'm not sure what would be there maybe power supplies or something a tape machine maybe there's some more stuff but it wasn't it, these systems would be separate modules and every part of them would be big using really custom um, large transistors or, or um, um, hardware and no part of these was like all combined onto one chip right you would have a CPU on a board a whole board because all the bits of the CPU would be physically laid out with different um, little chips with legs um, this kind of package dip package these kind of chips except the big kind that's just an eight eight pin dual inline package but physically big transistors it wouldn't be a microprocessor that has everything on the same die all of the the chips would be separate across a big um, a big board so you need a huge board to contain them um, someone's asking a question unrelated to the current topic is there a hurdle for the final exam and the answer is no there is not a hurdle for the final exam um, I've, uh, I think I answered, someone asked that question on the first day, no hurdles in this course um, you've had many assessment tasks and you, you have to get a, an, at least 50 as an average score across them all in order to pass the course um, yes, okay, I don't know if I, I don't know a lot about exactly what's inside these workstations but again like you weren't buying an Intel microprocessor because such things didn't exist the CPU was made of separate bits of, of logic and therefore it all required a lot more power you had to have a huge power supply probably huge cooling as well because it was going to get really hot and burn your house down or something I don't know um, the storage was huge like we have like SD cards with super dense storage now like a hard drive would be like again another washing machine it would be a whole thing a whole huge appliance with big platters like that big and a disk drive these computers don't even have disk drives that would but original floppy disks were eight inches an eight inch floppy drive is that that's like eight inches right <laughs> um, so floppy disk drives that was the first type were, were really huge um, it's just astounding how much smaller everything ended up getting we'll get to that in a minute they got to be small because people wanted them people wanted stuff on their desk so in the eight, 70s and 80s we got consumer computers and that had their own operating systems so this is where the MS-DOS stuff came from and where Microsoft came from and where a Apple came from and really all the computers that you care about <laughs> because they're the evolutions of the ones you use um, came from these computers that you'd have on your desk at home so here's an Apple II that's a, a Radio Shack TRS-80 which is affectionately called a Trash-80 and a Commodore PET 
And all of these computers, particularly this one, it just looks like it's from space, right? Star Trek. <laughs> Star Trek, Star Trek. That one's like Star Wars. And this one's Battlestar Galactica. Like, they just look crazy. So, they kind of, the original ones here didn't really have operating systems. They had back to system monitors. They had things that would let you run a program. And then it would, when your program stopped, it would go back to the system monitor. So it was running one program at a time. And each of those programs would have complete control over the, the computer. So it took a while for these things to get powerful enough to actually need an operating system. The reason they didn't need them is because their, their CPUs were so simple, so simple and bad that they did not need, they had no capacity to run multiple programs at once. They didn't have any spare cycles and the use case wasn't there for a user. So. They, they just weren't required. Still in that era, if you wanted to run two programs at once, you needed a washing machine, right? Not, not your little, um, little Apple II that would fit on your desk. By the way, when I was in kindergarten at primary school, when I was five, they still had these ones. And then I think like two years later, they were all gone. So this is um, a small part of my, my, um, my childhood is seeing these kind of computers around. Uh-huh. 1990s plus, eventually in the 90s, people started to have personal computers that were powerful enough to justify having lots of programs. This is not really an example of one because it's a computer that no one could afford to buy. It's called a Next Station. Um, it, but you can see it's got window, uh, multiple windows. It's running a, um, a piece of software called Next OS, which you might know by its latter title, Mac OS 10, actually, Mac OS X. But the, um, the next computers were something similar to those Xerox computers as being a super powerful personal computer, mainly marketed at universities. And, but they, they were kind of heralding in an era of having more powerful computers individually that could run multiple bits of software at once. And the, the CEO of Next was a guy called Steve Jobs, who had been the co-founder of Apple, and then he ended up back in Apple, and he brought all the Next stuff back with him. Huh, and now we're here. So here's two slides that have everything I just said. Um, maybe slightly, slightly more, um, more info. But the really relevant to today, it's weird because you think that this slide is relevant, but it's actually this slide which is relevant because this, this computer led to C um, language. It led to the Unix operating system and etc. So these kind of, the time when a small group of people could have their own computer to be just their very own, there, there was an explosion of, of things they could do and people started to really develop OSs that were more similar to what we now have. And in fact, we now use the descendants of those operating systems. And what are we here? Yeah, last 20 years, what else has happened? Well, we've had a lot of different kinds of general purpose OSs, like Solaris, which is dead, Linux, which we all often use in our labs. I'm using Linux to stream for you from, current Windows, which had a, a, there's been a few times when Windows has kept the same look, but had a completely different change under the hood to be more related to what was running on those, um, those PDP-11 computers. And Mac OS, which was um, originally came out of a different, not Unix operating system called BSD. And all of these OSs support some kind of, um, of multi-processing, multitasking. And we need it these days because everyone's got a million cores in their computer. So they all have to, we all have to have multi-processing all the time to make things work. So what does an operating system have? What does it need? What are the standard features? We don't really have any basic list and operating systems can be quite diverse if you zoom out and treat things as operating systems that aren't a general purpose computer with a human readable UI. There can be operating systems with tiny microkernels 
and there can, can be huge general purpose operating systems for your regular everyday work. And they're all operating systems and they all do different things. So what would be like the minimum set of features that you really need? Well, you've almost got a minimum set of features if you think about these. Memory management, so it can do, supports virtual memory or at least protecting um, different processes memory from each other. Process management and inter-process communication. As we said before, those are the basics uh, for an OS. Sometimes when you're developing, you don't need an OS. For instance, all of the development we've done on our micro bit so far has had no operating system. The runtime environment is just the computer itself. And you can do that on a big computer as well, but we just tend not to. <laughs> because it's, it's not very useful to boot your computer and turn it on and only run one single program. And then if you wanted to run a different program, you'd have to change the hard drive of your computer. Uh, so we tend to do this on an uh, embedded system, like a micro bit or a smartwatch or something that doesn't have an interface. It'll just run one program and no operating system. Um, absolutely. Someone said, I think I came across an OS for micro bit before in research. Something like Zephyr OS. I think that would be, I've got some different types of operating systems to look at later in slides, but you can have um, embedded OS operating systems, which are designed, often designed specifically to run on limited computers. So like a micro bit by itself can't actually run Linux because it doesn't support virtual memory. So it doesn't have it, not a feature. It has what's called a memory protection unit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, someone's asking me questions. Julian's asking me sneaky questions. You have an MPU memory protection unit. So that means you can have a way for one process to be have separate memory than another and for them not to see or be able to change each other's memory. Um, but you really need a um, have virtual memory supported to run Linux. So you can use some like particularly limited operating systems designed just for embedded systems. Um, Process management, we'll talk about this later in the lecture, but basically this was the idea of keeping multiple things going all together while tricking each one into thinking that they're just, they have complete access to the computer by themselves. <sighs> What's a task? Is this a good question? Hmm. I don't want to talk about that question right now, but I need a break. So ask me a question in the chat. Someone come up with a question. Does MicroPython, this is for Julian, does MicroPython support multiple programs running at once? Why does my slide font change for a moment? Julian is the one who develops my website, so he can ask himself that question. <sighs> What's a task? I don't know what a task is. <laughs> I think you do. What's next? Where am I at? <laughs> I don't know why it does that. Maybe it's because I've zoomed? Oh uh, yeah, the zoom. Okay, so we're talking about MicroPython, which can sometimes catch your program if it crashes and tell you what the error was. But maybe that's more like a, a system monitor than, a, than an operating system. So it's sort of an OS, but not quite. Yeah, a task is an activity that takes a period of time. It might have a, a start and an ending and it might do some access, some resources as it's going. 
might have a level of importance. So it's an activity which has uh, a duration, maybe a priority, right? and might have resources it needs so keep this in mind because I guess when we're talking about OS's the OS is important but what the OS does is enable tasks <laughs> and each of the tasks they're going to be our client programs ta test task each task is going to be a, a different program, app A, app B, app C. And what the OS's job really is to do is to make sure that these tasks work um, correctly, as soon as possible, and with a minimum of fuss. So that's the, the OS's job. Okay, back to a few more ideas. Memory management. Remember memory? <laughs> We've talked about this a lot so far. And the OS is responsible for sharing around. So we talked about <coughs> allocation and deallocation a few weeks ago. And we made that, um, what was that silly memory allocator, Smalloc? We made Smalloc. So when you're in an operating system and you call Smalloc, the thing that's actually done the, the implementation of that is the OS. So maybe your, um, your programming language supports a library that knows how to ask the operating system for some memory. And at the end of the day, it's the, the operating system doing that to give you, um, give you bytes on disk to use or bytes in memory to use. Then we have this idea of virtual memory, which I explained before. Each process thinks it has the whole memory space, but it's actually just got a weird, a weird part. And maybe it's got multiple parts that are just stitched together and it doesn't even know. So you've got a virtual address space for each, um, independently for each application. Then you've got memory protection. <coughs> memory protection. So there might be each op um, application not only has its own address space, but it's not possible for that application to directly read the address spaces of other applications. But then you might also want some shared memory, so maybe the OS can give you that as well. And what, what is it we can do on a micro bit? Well, the micro bit doesn't have a memory protection, doesn't have a virtual memory capacity, but it does have a memory protection unit. So if I'm in the Cortex M4 technical reference manual, it can tell me that the MPU is a component for memory protection. It supports the ARMv7 protected memory system architecture model, and it provides full support for protecting regions, overlapping protection regions, access permissions, exporting memory attributes to the system, etc. So you can use the MPU to enforce privilege. We'll talk about that in a minute. Separate processes and enforce access rules. I wonder if there's any more useful information here. Now we have to look more in the, the programmer's model and we don't get much more information here than this. We have to look in the main, the main reference to see what these things do. But if you wanted to use the MPU, which you, you can, are free to do, you can use these registers to, to set it up and prevent some tasks from seeing other tasks' memory. Uh -huh. Synchronization, interprocess communication. So all of that stuff that we were doing in lecture eight talking about multiple processes working at once and having shared variables to track um, keeping track of which one can go first that would require some kind of interprocess communication and synchronization very important stuff 
hardware abstraction, the OS would hopefully take care of all of the, the uh, load twiddle store stuff for writing to GPIO. And then you would have to have, for specific devices, you have a driver which will give you just some functions to call to do this stuff for you. So now here's, I guess, what is really the most important part of an operating system, the actual program itself. And we usually call that role, that program, a kernel because operating systems have lots of um, aspects. But the kernel is like the program that runs that has these core functions. So all of the access to CPU, memory, peripherals all go through the kernel. And the way this works is that your computer, your operating system provides some functions called system calls. I wonder where that links to. And we'll get to it in a minute. A system call to do something. So you might, I mean, if you were making a micro bit operating system, you might have a system call called turn LED on. And when you're, when someone else is writing a program, they could use this system call and that would ask the kernel to do this task on their behalf. So system calls are functions that the OS provides for a, a application to say, OS, please do something for me. I don't know how to do it or I can't do it because I'm not allowed. So it's like, you know, when a kid is wants something and they're not allowed, it's on a high shelf, they have to ask their parent to go and get it. So the operating system has put all of the th important tasks on the high shelf memory, allocation, peripherals, um, you know, what else has it got on the high shelf? GPU, etc. These are all on the high shelf and we have to call for our an adult to come and help us to access these things because they're at a high, a high level of privilege. Now I've got three slides here. I'm going to, someone's got a question. Uh, Someone said, should we use the MPU to protect against memory? Um, the memory hack in lab six, where you were writing a self-assessment function. Maybe, but there would have to be separate tasks for it to work. <laughs> so you might, it might not work, but you could potentially. I've forgotten what the exact wording of the task was. This this little guy, this um, squirrel, has a kernel of some kind of nut. And we've got some a few slides here to help you remember what a kernel does through pictures. So the kernel is the core of your operating system. It's the really important bit that you might like to store close and hold close to your heart as an uh, important aspect of your computing experience. What does an operating system do? Well, it's a bridge between hardware Hardware over here. Well, I should run in red. I need red. Hardware and software. So it's connecting these two things. Hardware is connected to software through the kernel. What about this? A plate of nachos. Well, a kernel, these could be shared system resources. And the kernel provides nice little system calls so that people can access a shared resource by picking it up and eating it. I don't know, they give it back eventually, which is a bit weird in nachos, but you get what I mean. Bridge between hardware and software and shared access to resources. So we can have a look at, on Linux, the actual system calls that are available. Maybe my computer does look like a plate of nachos. Where's my syscalls? Oh yeah, here's all the syscalls. All this stuff, I don't really know what these things are. I'm not a great uh, Linux system programmer. Yeah. 
they're all defined here somewhere. Anyway, you want to know about how to do how to do stuff in um, in Linux? This is where you have to start looking. All of your different system calls. What was the? Isn't there a help command for system calls? Man, syscalls. Oh well, I'll remember what it is in a minute. And there's stuff for Windows as well, which I'm even less familiar with. So we're gonna just have a look at. One more technical topic, then we'll do some, some coding because I know we're getting tired and desperate to code like I am right now. We'll look at what a kernel could look like and a couple of different models of how a kernel can be structured. So this is sort of the main one, a monolithic kernel, monolithic operating system. So you have a big stack of all of the stuff that an operating system does in one program and it has built in all of the access to all of the hardware that you need. And it can be really efficient if you do everything well, but it's gonna be tricky to port it to a different system that has different hardware because it's all built into the kernel itself. All that, all of those um, special memory mapped registers, the way that it should interact with all different hardware has to be built right in. And it could be a bit unreliable because it's just too big and difficult to maintain. And all of the services that the operating system maintains are at the same, in the same program as the kernel. So if the kernel can access it, so can those services. And this is a bit of an older idea. Um, everything, things don't work this way these days because we tend to have some kind of modularity. So we have maybe some modules somewhere in the middle here. This is a, a this is your, like your micro bit stuff, memory match registers. Here's the operating system. It has services that might be uh, above that. And then this is your applications tasks. So in order to help your operating system run on different hardware, you might have a way for someone to write a device driver that plugs into your, your kernel. And it may be that you can actually, while running your OS, kick one of these modules out and put it in a new one. So while the engine is running, start repl replacing parts of the car. Seems dangerous, but that's how it works in Linux. You can totally do that. It's less works a bit less than like that in Windows, which tends to be why you have to reboot Windows so often. I'm not sure if that is because that's it needs to work that way or if it's like just part of the received wisdom of how Windows works. But it's always been that Linux, or in more recent times, that Linux has had more of a modular kernel and allowed you to, to kick out modules and, and reinstall modules um, with particular functions. You can do it from the operating, the, a command prompt with like mod probe that lets you um, add and remove Linux kernel modules. A slightly dramatically different way of running a kernel is to have what people call a micro kernel and we've used the, the terminology mu for micro. Micro kernels where you make your kernel as small as possible. And then you have lots of different kinds of tasks where some of the tasks actually are sort of what might be part of the Linux kernel. So different, uh, different operating system services that are running as if they're tasks, talking to each other with inter-process communication. So the idea here is that you have something which is very small and hopefully more reliable because it's easier to um, keep track of it. This is a cool idea. It's been one that people have predicted would, would take over for many years, but never quite gotten there. So um, there's more like a research project idea. Um, things like Minix, L4, Microkernel, Mu. These are all sort of research-based operating systems, not actually running on everyday systems. And this is a screen capture from a famous movie called Jurassic Park, and it, 
it comes at a point in the lecture where I say that there is one very important operating system to know about, and it's Unix. Because it's sort of the basis of a lot of computer science concepts. It's in, integrated into the history of computer science. And it's even become so integrated into history that it was a part of a movie, Jurassic Park, a blockbuster movie, about an island full of dinosaurs which becomes very dangerous. Who would have predicted that if you make an island full of dinosaurs it becomes a dangerous place to be? And um, the... I'll get someone to ask a good question. I'll get to that in a second. There's some kids running around this island and they need to protect themselves from the dinosaurs and they, the, the young lady opens up a computer and says, I know this, it's Unix. And I, I hope that every student in COM2300, if you were in a similar dinosaur danger situation and you opened a computer and it was Unix, you would say, this is Unix system, I know this. <laughs> Very important. Someone said, isn't Minix something to do with Linux? And that's, that's absolutely true. So there's a guy called, I forgot his first name, Tenenbaum, a famous CS researcher. And he wanted to make a, an OS. And, uh, his goal was to make an operating system that would be sort of like Unix, but Unix needed a PDP-11 to run, which was too expensive and difficult. At that time, he observed that a, a computer science student could afford a, you know, some number of thousands of dollars, maybe n thousand dollars, where n is like one to three. They could buy a computer called an IBM PC in the early 90s. Um, IBM PC um, were a really popular personal computer. They were better than the the Apple IIs, but um, still quite weak. But he wrote a Unix-like operating system for the IBM PC that he called Minix. I don't know exactly why, but I think it might be called that because it's like a mini Unix, right? <laughs> the IBM PC is a smaller, less powerful computer, so you had to do without some things. Then later on, um, someone called Linus Torvalds saw the source code for Minix because Tenenbaum was giving it away for free as part of a, a teaching course. Basically, he wanted CS students to be able to have this operating system and see the source code to learn how it works. So he saw it and he made his own version, own kernel called Linux. And of course, Linux took off and become really famous and useful and Minix, not so much. But that didn't stop, I think, Mark Tenenbaum because he had other other Minixes, including Minix 3, more recent, and that has a microkernel approach. <clears throat> and he famously says, every operating system is going to use a microkernel, and not so, so too bad. Uh, yeah, what is special about Unix? It was very famous as a first kind of accessible uh, multitasking operating system. It was sort of open source before that was a thing. Um, it was owned by research labs and ended up becoming closed source, but led to a culture of openness about how um, we use computers, which is really influential in the way we do computer science today. But that's a p sort of political cultural stuff. What is it as a technology? It had a number of innovations, hierarchical file system that you could um, access have these system calls to access it. A way to access everything in your system using a file, which wasn't always the way things should work, but it's on, that's a, a classic line about Linux is that everything is a file. You could make new processes by duplicating them. You can choose what your user interface is, a choice of shell, that was the, like, here's the kernel. <coughs> Excuse me. Kernel, whoops. The kernel lives here. And then there's a shell, which is where your user interface lives. So you can have different shells around Unix and Linux. And quite portable, because it was written in C, not only in, not in assembly for a particular kind of mainframe. And it led to all of these different kinds of operating systems. Unix with a C, Unix, BSD, Xenix, System 5, QNX, Irix, SunOS, Ultrix, Cynix. Mark, that's, or match, 
that was what we use on macOS. Plan 9, next step, again related to macOS, AIX, HP Yux, Solaris, NetBSD, FreeBSD, Linux, we always often use that. OpenStep, OpenBSD, Darwin, part of um, OS, Mac OS as well. QNX, OSX, etc. So lots of different unices. People sometimes write it this way. The unices. <clears throat> okay, privilege. This is where we get to the interesting stuff because we can do some demos. What do you think privilege means? And I'll give you a hint, which is that it's not this one. <laughs> Check your privilege. Although it might be useful. Check your privilege at the door. It's a word we use a lot these days to, to recognize the, the different advantages that people have um, without even knowing about it sometimes. But in a computer science terminology, what does privilege mean? Someone type in an, a thought in the chat. And how does it affect code on your micro bit? <clears throat> <clears throat> what gets access to resources when multiple things want them? Yeah. So maybe it's might control access to resources in some way. And that's a good suggestion. Yeah. What else? Everyone's gone to sleep. That's okay. I'll keep talking. Now basically, I mean, this is a conceptual diagram, but you could have a model where privilege gives you more access to more stuff. More access to more stuff. This is not the same as interrupt. Someone said interrupt privilege, but that's not a thing. It's interrupt priority. And that's not right. This is not what we're talking about. No, 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 not that. It's a way of controlling access to stuff. And we haven't even introduced this topic on microbit, so it's gonna be hard to conceptualize it. This is not, some people, I've, I've asked questions about privilege in exams and people start talking about interrupt priorities. Ooh, no, 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 no. That's not a good, not a good way to go. So you could have a model where your, your OS kernel has the most privilege. So if the OS kernel wants something about your computer, it can just do it. It has complete access to that computer. Then your, your kernel might have some lower parts of it, maybe kind of device drivers that can only access their stuff. And then you might have like the, the applications that have the least privilege. And if they want something, they have to ask for it. They don't just get it. Yeah, so we're suggesting if you look at this from a, a, a user perspective, a human user perspective on an OS, you could have admin privileges. So that would let you do some things that you can't normally do with an application. Um, but still, those are a different kind of privileges because those are um, kind of OS user privileges. They're related, but not the same. In some way, we're talking about hardware privileges. So an application, even if it wanted to turn on an LED using GPIO, it's not allowed to. It can't even talk to those memory map registers. It doesn't even know they're there. I don't know what Riot Vanguard issue is. You can, you can tell me, um, explain to me what Riot Vanguard is. <laughs> now there's lots of ways for a computer and an OS to organize privilege. It's partly the, partly the OS can handle this, but it would require some hardware support as well. 
because if the hardware doesn't support privilege, then as soon as a, a, another process or another task, an application has control of the execution state, they could start doing what they want. So the hardware has to have some way to know that applications shouldn't be able to, to do whatever they want and stop them. Or invasive game anti cheat. Ah, I see. Yeah, so that, those annoying, yeah, it's irritating when software needs to have like a kernel module or something installed to try to stop you cheating in your game because really normal software shouldn't have um, kernel privileges. Yeah, and your phone apps have this stuff in these days. When you install an app on your phone, it's like, do you want to give it access to the camera? Do you want to give it access to the GPS? And if you open a phone app, which is called like Solitaire123, and it wants to have access to your contacts, GPS, browser history, photos, and microphone, you're like, uh, no, you're supposed to be a Solitaire app. Why are you wanting all those things? Probably to do something dodgy with your computer. So software privileges are one thing, but hardware privilege is making sure that your hard, your individual applications can't just go around these, these limitations. Yeah, me when I open my calculator and it wants my location. No, thank you. So, in hardware on Cortex-M4, certain things, instructions, can only be executed in a privileged mode. So different architectures do this in different ways, but in our architecture, we can um, look it up in the reference manual, which we will in a second, section A.2.3.4. There's also like a, a fun video linked here about what DOS protected mode is, and this is sort of an early, early interactions with these ideas that different games had to deal with. So let's have a look in the manual. Oh. Here it was, what was it, 2.3.4. Is that two? No. Oh, was that, am I talking about the right manual? Yeah, I'm V7M reference manual. A2. Point three point four. privileged execution. So this explains how how this is implemented on our um, on our ARM system, but basically we can learn from this is a few things. We've got two modes: the so-called thread mode, which is we can be privileged or can be unprivileged, and then another mode called handler mode, which is always privileged. And once your your um, micro bit knows which mode you're executing in and the trick is that when you're in an exception or an interrupt you're suddenly in handler mode so there's some kind of diagram here i think now I've, I've got this better better illustrated on a slide i believe here we are privileged code unprivileged code Thread mode, this is regular code, always in thread mode, can be either privileged or unprivileged. And normally we're always in privileged mode. We, we aren't stopping anybody doing anything normally on, on your micro bit. When you're in an exception, you're always in handler mode. So this privileged versus unprivileged on your micro bit, what this can mean is that you are stopping certain instructions from being run you can stop memory from being re read and written to using the MPU, and you can stop certain memory map registers being accessed. So that's handy if you wanted to make an operating system for your micro bit, isn't it? So I guess the first step for, for your micro bit operating system would be to say, okay, you, the task can start, you've got a, a function here, and before you go before your OS goes BL task, it says switch to unprivileged mode. I don't even really know how to do that. Someone might tell me quickly how to change to unprivileged mode. I've forgotten if I ever knew. 
Assignment 3 OS. Well, more like Lab 12 OS, <laughs> Joshua. So, so far so good. We've got a task now which is in, in unprivileged mode, and but that task wants to turn on an LED. How's it going to do it? We need to get, we need to send a message to the operating system. And the way we do that is to trigger an interrupt because the interrupt will run an interrupt handler and the interrupt handler will have been written by the operating system or it's in control of the operating system. So when you're in handler, as soon as you're in the interrupt, you end up in handler mode, the operating system mode. And if you wanted a, a task to really be unprivileged, like that code wouldn't be allowed to have interrupt handlers in it. Um, I don't know how we'd prevent it from doing so, but your, your regular applications aren't allowed to have interrupt handlers. They're only allowed to, to have functions that can be called by an operating system um, and run in unprivileged mode. The, only, the, the, the assign, only the OS is allowed to define interrupt handlers. And how do we trigger uh, an interrupt on purpose? And during the, on the weekend, um, you know, uh, one of our followers, right, <laughs> In the, uh, in the chat, talked about an instruction called UDF, which always triggers an interrupt. This, this would work, but it's not a good choice because there's a specific instruction set up to do this called SVC, which is this one, the supervisor call instruction. This is handy. So this runs an SVC uh, interrupt immediately. Triggers that interrupt that's run by the, uh, provided by the OS. And the reason we have to have an interrupt is because as soon as we're in that interrupt, we'll be in privileged mode. So the OS can then do what it needs to do that um, our regular app can't do. There's also a way of like having a deferred in um, a deferred call if it's not urgent. But we're just going to talk about the regular one today. Well, let's give it a go. Should we make one? the SVC handler and the SVC command. So I suppose I'll just make a program here, nop, nop, and then I've got the SVC command. And I know from my slide that SCV has an immediate. Oops. So I'm going to put a number in there, 11. Can only be an 8-bit number, but there we go. And we'll see how my program goes. I've got a, a micro bit connected, I think, yeah. Build and debug. I'm not actually in unprivileged mode, am I? I'm just, I'm just running regular privileged code, but I'm just interested in knowing how this works. So here we are, we're in the default handler. So that's, that's not very useful right now, is it? I'm going to have to get myself in the, it was called the SVC handler, I believe. I'll just look in my um, startup script. Yep, SCV handler. And I'll just put some knobs here and so we can see where we Prove to ourselves that we get in here. Prove that it works. Oh, I need to do dot global, don't I? Whoops. Whoops dot com dot handler. Otherwise it won't work. It'll go to the default handler. Okay, so we're in my, my SVC handler and we're back. Now the problem is that I've got an 11 here. Now how am I going to know what system call is being called? Normally you'd use these numbers to represent different codes. Like one of them is, you know, print a character on the screen or get me more memory or, um, you know, print something to a printer or talk on the network. So each number in the immediate value would be like a separate message to request the operating system to do a particular task. How am I going to get that 11 inside my handler? That's a question for you folks. Tell me in the chat, how am I going to get 11? 
how am I going to access the 11 from the SV handler? Knowing that the 11 is an immediate. I can wait all day. I'll play a little tune while I'm waiting. <clears throat> Um, no, I'm in arpeggio mode, don't want that. I can go all day with my awful music. I'm, I'm waiting for someone to tell me how to access the 11. Not even a single idea. Ooh, someone's got an idea. What exactly is SVC 11 doing? SVC 11 is, um, it, it stands for supervisor call, and all it's doing is triggers the SVC handler interrupt. <laughs> Truly no clue. I was, I was hoping someone would have a clue, because it's, when you, when you see it, it's obvious and stupid. What's the stupidest way that you could find out to get that 11? Must be stored somewhere in memory, mustn't it? Yeah, this must be in memory. Where is SVC 11 in memory? Where is, where is that 11 going? <laughs> Where does the 11 go? Oh, somewhat realization is dawning. Ooh, it's somewhere near PC, isn't it? So that 11 is in the instruction stream. We'll just view memory. Or actually, I don't want that. I want to um, disassemble Use assembly of main that's got SVC 11. And this bit is that's the 11 OB. It's in the instruction stream somewhere. Here's a trick. So, how do I get it back? How do I get it back? When I'm, I'm in my handler and I need to access it. So, PC is pointing to that SVC 11. Now PC is pointing to the next instruction. And now PC is pointing to here. Where did the old PC go back to? I need to find that instruction. Yeah. The people, you're saying it's cringe, but it's like, this is how computers work. <laughs> this is how they work. It's not nice, like, you know, nice Haskell, pure functions. Ah, it's it. Well, remember about interrupts. Is LR, is the LR, someone's saying you should use the link register. Um, but I can't because the link register has a special value. Remember this one. I'll just, we'll just have a look at PC and LR over here. So PC is OX200, OX202. OX204, and now it's OX20E, and link register is minus 7. Hmm. Or OXFFFFFF9. OXFFFFFF9 doesn't look a lot like OX20 something, which was where I was before. So what happens to the, what happened to the old PC when I were, went into the interrupt? Remember our interrupts lecture? What happens to the PC when I go into the interrupt?
Well done. Pushed onto the stack. It goes on the stack. Sorry, I clapped. It probably made everyone's headphones explode. Yeah, because when I enter an interrupt, entering an interrupt, lots of registers end up automatically on the stack. Hmm, where on the stack? Let's have a look. How am I going to find out? <laughs> um, I go in the big manual, first of all. Whenever in doubt, start reading the you know, 1500 or 800 page manual from front to back, and that should sort you out. Programmer's model. Here we go. In exceptions, faults, and interrupts. Browse, browse, browse. I think it's down here somewhere. I hope so. FP extension. No, I need the, the system level programmer's model. That's the one. Um, the exception model. That's interrupts or exceptions. And I've got my list of exceptions. Some priority stuff. Oh, almost. It's down here somewhere. What I'm looking for is what happens to the stack when we enter an exception. Exception entry behavior. Stack alignment on exception entry, getting very close. Here we go. Alignment options when stacking the basic frame. So here's what, what ends up on, or the, here's the frame of information pushed onto the stack on exception entry and how the processor reserves an additional word on the stack if necessary. So my return address, when I, when I go back to my function, is in OX18. This is no longer cringe, this is, it's the real way to do stuff. So I need to get my old PC back, OX18. So, what do I do? Litter, R0, the current SP, Am I allowed to do that? I think so, yeah. Okay. Let's run my program again and see if we can get it back. Oh, uh, yeah, OX206. There we go, so that should be one of my instructions. And it's going to be the 16 bytes before OX206, right? <laughs> we'll start loading things and we'll see if it works. It's a 16-bit instruction, I believe. Um, yeah. So this is good. This is testing your lecturer's um, <laughs> model of uh, how PC works. R1, R0, minus 1. Is that allowed? I hope so. I don't think you can do a minus 1 in there. I'll give it a try and see if it'll let me. Not minus 1, minus 4. Uh, no, minus 2? There we go. DFOB. I just need to swizzle off. I really just want the 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 single byte before that. I just want that byte, not the whole thing. That DF is the instruction code, I believe. One one oh one F. That's F, and this that's D. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Um, what's that in, in decimal? 1 plus 4 plus 8, that's 13. A is 10. A, B, C, D, yeah. D is, is 13. So I managed to get, by counting backwards, two bytes from my, from that point, the, the, sorry, I'm not making any sense. The PC, when I entered the interrupt, was equal to this line of code. So I want the previous line of code, 
and I know that it's a 16-bit instruction. So I stepped back two bytes from my old um, PC and just loaded the half word, letter H. That got me OXDFOB. I know from my, my code here that that's D, that's F, and this was the OB. That was my actual, um, my actual immediate that I wanted to get. So I'm just going to get the OB by itself, and I think that's going to be stored first. So I'm going to go step back another byte and just get it. I'm just going to do this by process of elimination because I'm talking at the same time and not functioning highly enough to actually see if it works. What? I didn't go into my... Um, didn't end up in my... Interrupt. Oh, that's not right. I need to go back four. No, that's not right either. What am I doing wrong? I don't need to use FP, no. I'll have a look in memory and remember what it was I was doing. OB, so when I'm here, I need to go back one, two. Oh, and just get that exact byte. Sorry, I was right in the first time. R0 minus 2, and that should get me OB. Ah, got it. R1 is B, so I got the, I got the 11. I could shift the, heart, the half word. I could do this and then do some shifts, or I could just take exactly the byte I want out of memory. I'm, I'm looking at one byte of memory, and I can do a byte load, I just want to load one byte. I was, I was right the first time, minus two was correct. No, yeah, I'm, I appreciate um, the skepticism that, some, that minus numbers should work, but it does, it does work. It can handle negative offsets. It does seem to be able to do it. So now, now R1 contains um, OXOB equal to 11, which was my um, the immediate of my SVC instruction. Assembly must look like magic to anyone who hasn't read the manual. Well, I mean, it looks like magic to even people who have read the manual sometimes, doesn't it? Folks, it would, it would certainly take... It's hard to know this information. I don't know how I know this. I think I learned from a previous lecture of Comp 2300 how you're supposed to do this, and I didn't learn it myself from the manual. But, you know, some folks among you are certainly doing little investigations, finding things in the manual and being like, what is that instruction for? And if you do that, it's possible to, to understand these things. And really, you know, you folks came into this thinking that this was going to be completely cooked, trying to understand how to get that, that um, immediate out. It's only two lines of code. Come on, that's not that bad. <laughs> so this one is defined, access the old PC from the stack. Find in manual, um, extract the one byte immediate from the 16-bit instruction before the old PC. Uh, why is the SP offset by OX18? Because when, when we enter any interrupt at all, remember from the interrupts lecture, the interrupt hardware automatically stores a whole lot of stuff on the stack. It's automatically putting um, your call, uh, call e save registers, no, call er save registers on the stack. It's putting your SP, old S, not your old SP, it's putting your old PC, your flags, etc., all going on the stack. 
and the manual tells us exactly what order they're put on the stack, or you could just experiment and find out. But we know from the manual that as soon as an interrupt occurs, your, your stack looks like this. It's got R0, R1, R2, R3, R12, uh, LR, that was R14, and the return address, OX18, and the, um, the flags, and then it's got an extra um, an extra word just for good measure, just in case things aren't aligned, it puts that extra word in. So we can see here that our old PC, which is the return address from our interrupt, is going to be an OX18 up from the base of the stack, or the, the current stack value. It's not, uh, well, it may, it may feel like your mind is being blown here, but this is why I was teaching you about this stuff, right? Because it turns out that it's important. If you're, you, when you're in an operating system and you want to know why when you type print, words come out on the screen, it's because when you type print, it does a system call, asks the operating system to print words out on the screen for you, and print is going to be one of these numbers that the operating system knows how to decode, gets it out of the stack, does something with it that's useful, and then returns your program to your flow of execution. So this is really useful. I'm actually going to make you do this in a lab, <laughs> not this week, because your lab this week is already set up. But I think next week, you're going to write a supervisor uh, call, a system call in your lab, um, in your, and you're going to do a, a bit of a fake operating system over two weeks, but you might do this part in, in week 11. Yeah, that value was from the manual. Although you can you can certainly figure it out just by kind of examining the, the memory state using the debugger. Um, I'll show you, I think, on, uh, on Thursday, because we're running out of time, I'll show you on Thursday what the, the manual for a really old processor might look like. And it's sort of disappointing these days. I'm, I'm, it's not disappointing for you, because you get to do it. I've and us at the ANU have forced you folks to read the manual for a CPU, which is something many programmers have never done, right? Really important and transformative experience to get, know, get to know all these little details. Um, and older programmers might have played around with old uh, CPUs, like the MOS 6502, very simple CPU, and they would have read the manual and understood it. So before I go, before I go, I've got a thought which is, I'll put this somewhere else. Um, my thought is, do you folks really know how to make an assignment that runs an interactive program? <laughs> and I think that some of you might have a, an inkling and some of you might not. Uh, by the way, if there's any questions, ask them now. I'm officially, how long am I through this lecture? Yeah, halfway. The rest of it I'm going to do on Thursday. Um, for the next five minutes, I'm just going to talk about an approach to the assignment. I'll probably write this down on the website as well. But here's the idea. You've got a program running. Maybe your, your main function is the, the basic part of your interactive program. I could say you're running a digital pet, but I think I like to do make it so that you're running something else. Maybe you're running, you're writing a robot and you've got a remote control for your robot, just as a, a different non-assignment task. Yeah, we just use the buttons and stuff to make the user interact. I know, that seems like it's obvious, but like, how do you just do that? And if you're not, if you've never done it before, you might find it challenging to know what to do. So I've, the first thing I've done is I've, um, I'm actually going to make another something here called main loop. When I teach in my other subject, COM1720, they have a, a basic kind of program sketch setup for making an interactive program. And I'll just show you what it looks like. p5js.org, and we go to the editor. This is in um, 
Mandarin for some reason, I'm not sure why. I don't know why that's happening. I hope it doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, they've got their basic editor with two functions set up. This is in JavaScript. And the first function is called setup, and the second function is called draw. And the way it works is that setup runs once at the beginning of your code, and then draw runs lots of times. And its draw is like one single frame. So you can maybe have a background and then draw an ellipse, you know, uh, 0, 0, 50, 50. And it will draw a circle there. And you could set up over here some kind of variables int x, int y, I'll have to give them a value because it's JavaScript. Is that really a thing? Maybe I'll just make them x and y. Sorry, I forgot we're in JavaScript and don't need to have. Um, and we go x plus plus, y plus plus. I'm, I'm taking a long time to do something boring now, but every frame it's getting updated and the ball is moving across the screen. And then it disappears and disappears forever. How do we do the same thing in assembly programming? Well, let's do it. We've got now a main loop. That's going to be our draw loop. We call it draw. Draw loop. Draw loop. And we've got a setup function. So maybe the first thing you do when your code starts is to run your setup function, bl setup. You know, this might set up your GPIO, you know, um, read something from memory if it has to, I don't know. And in your draw loop, then you might BL into a lot of other stuff. And maybe you've got like two things your robot can do, go left and function go right. I'm not going to put any detail here in here because you know how to do things on your micro bit. If you want, if I say turn an LED on, you know how to do that. But the the question is, which I think is confusing people, is how to put this all together with some interaction. So your draw loop, you could say go left and BL go right. Well, okay. I'm going to do every sort of frame, I'm going to do a bit of go left and a bit of go right, but that means I'm not going to get anywhere. I'm going to be just turning back and forth. Really, I need to have some way of choosing whether to go left or right. And a good way of doing that might be a, a global variable. And I'm going to say that my global variable is called robot direction, right? And we can really only store numbers in, and deal with numbers in assembly. So we'll just say that if it's 0 equals left and 1 equals right. So we're going to load up our first thing we do is load up our global variable. Um, how do I do that again? L letter uh, 0 equals Someone's asking me a really good question on Piazza about I2C. I don't, I don't know how to set it up, so I'll be asking one of my tutors to help you with that one. <laughs> um, we'll get the, that's the address is an R0, and I'm going to get the actual value, R1. And now maybe I will um, do a, I'll just do a compare to 1. And I might call this left that one right. So we're just doing a kind of basic case statement of which thing to do. Well, so far so good, but how do we determine what direction the robot goes? Well, you could 
set that using your interrupt routine. So you might have already set up uh, your GPIO TE handler. Is that what it's called? I think so. I've totally forgotten what the GPIO TE handler is called. Ah, IRQ handler. GPIO TE IRQ handler. And this might, you know, I'm not going to put in the code, but read from pins which button was pushed and then set uh, the global variable robot direction. So, so you have a system where when someone presses a button on their micro bit, it triggers an interrupt handler which sets a global variable. And then every time you go through your draw loop, you check that global variable and then you decide to go left or right. So in some sense, in this area, we're polling. But we're not polling the GPIO, we're polling a global variable that the GPIO sets on our behalf. Because if we're in the middle of going left, which might take some time, we want the system to be responsive to our button clicks and just set up that global variable for us until we, while we get back to the start of the draw loop, then we can decide what to do. And this would be a really typical way of programming any kind of interactive system. Rather than having huge amounts of code in our IRQ handler, interrupt handler, we have a small amount of code here just to set up some kind of state or a mode or a variable or a direction or something that describes what our system is supposed to do. And then we have a main loop which is just running over and over again um, doing, doing the stuff that we need to happen. I mean, it's the same as if you've ever written Arduino code for a, um, these kind of prototyping platforms. I wonder if I can actually get the code here. Where are uh, Arduino in the cloud? Does that open a, an editor? Yeah. Get started. What? Do I have to log in? Surely not. I just want to, I just want to make a thing. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to sign in. All right, it's not going to happen. But when you're coding for Arduino, I think you get another thing. There's a setup function and a loop function. Same idea. Setup runs once at the start and loop runs over and over. Okay, I'm going to ask, answer some questions here. If you know how to use the I2C bus, there's an epic question waiting on Piazza for you. I'll, we'll deal with that in my Piazza time. Um, unrelated question. Do you ever want to use the tasks part of the GPIO TE since it's GPIO? And if so, can you use both tasks and events at the same time? Something like automated control of LEDs. I think you can. I think you can set a way. I'm just not sure how it works on the NRO52, but I think there's some way that if an event occurs, it can automatically trigger a task. So you can have these things set up um, so that um, some kind of immediate output occurs from an interrupt automatically. Some of your tutors know about that, so let's make it a question on Piazza. Could you please ask that question? Um, Nick knows about tasks and events, and he can tell you. Is this a lot like model view controller? Um, well, sort of, except we don't have a model and we don't have a view. Uh, <laughs> maybe. I think MVC is a bit high level for this situation. Um, we just don't have that much, we don't have any API or any framework beneath us. If we were building a, a heavier system where we had maybe some high level representation of the LEDs on the screen, then you might have like your view code in that um, running in maybe a different thread even on an OS um, system. But things are so low level here. MVC is really for dealing with applications that have to work on a, on a big computer in an OS with, um, with more moving parts. And we just don't have that many moving parts here. So I think you can kind of have a model controller architecture. You might have components of your, your code which are just dealing with your data storage, but really your, your app is pretty simple. 
um, compared to something that's really going to take advantage of model view control up. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that as, as your main inspiration here. Someone's saying, so we can change the global variable even if it's set as OXO in the data initially. Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason you can't change this. I just set it to zero. I, I only really set it to zero just so that to hold the space there because then I might want to have like robot, you know, headlights or something. <laughs> I might have lots of global variables. Uh, robot mode. And if I want, uh, if I want to have some memory attached to this label, I have to put a word in there so that the next label points to the next bit of memory. If I didn't have the word in there, both this label and this label would both point to that bit of memory, which is not what I want. So there's the, all of these are readable, they're all writable, there's no, no access control here. No privilege exists in our system right now. You can totally change it. Yeah, I guess... Um, Yeah, but the question, someone suggested, well, controller is separated because the inputs are specifically handled in handlers, but that's not what controller means in MVC because the, the controller is whatever code is negotiating things that go on the screen or things that are in the UI and things that are in the data model. And your data model might be in a database, right? So it's, it's a, a more complicated to, to touch data framework. We don't have that. We've got, you know, three words in memory. We just don't need to have big complex systems dealing with our data model. Um, our view is all of the inputs and outputs. Inputs are also part of view. So that's MVC, not so useful, yeah. In, I mean, in a, in a complicated MVC system, your data model might not even all be on your device, right? Some data might be in the cloud or on a network share somewhere, or it needs to be synchronized with someone else's data. So there's a whole, a whole deal with that where it's really useful to be able to abstract all the data control, all the data parts from all the UI parts so that different people on different teams can deal with them. Um, this is not like that situation. Any other questions? Or I'm going to wrap it up for the day. Well, it, was, it became a really fun lecture once we started um, doing some code, didn't it? <laughs> Um, I'm glad we get these chances to, to really have a hack. I'll work on this example. Maybe we'll talk a bit more about it on Thursday. Work on it this week and, and put it somewhere public for everyone to see so that you can kind of see how I'm conceptualizing what your program might look like because I'd, I'd like people to have a good start with their assignment. Okay. Ah, no more questions rolling in. If you've got more questions, ask them on the Piazza. Folks, I will see you on Thursday morning. Until then, have a great week.